we're going to work on today are the ones where we're using the Cascadia mesh, but we're actually not going to do any fault problems with uh, the gravity. You, you can include those later on if you want. But for now, we're just going to show what the effects of gravity are. So the first one is the simplest. So we have gravitational body forces where we um, compute it for just an elastic problem. And then we use initial stresses to balance um, the body forces. However, we don't apply the correct initial stresses. Instead, we apply um, initial stresses that are computed analytically, assuming a constant mantle density. So when we do that, uh, the stresses are out of balance and you get significant deformation. So I can show you very quickly. Um, this is our model, right? So we have uh, different densities for all our materials. So the most dense is our slab. So it's got a density of 3,400. And then our mantle is about 3,300. And we have lighter or less dense materials for the, uh, for the wedge and for the crust. So the question is, what would we expect if we apply initial stresses that assuming this density for the entire thing? So I don't know if you know the answer or not. Um, but what happens is that uh, relative to this, this is heavier and this is lighter. So you, what would you expect to have happen is have this go up and this go down. So that's our first example. So our next example is uh, where we again use uh, gravitational body forces for an elastic problem, but then instead of using these analytically computed uh, initial stresses, we actually use the output from the first one for our uh, initial stresses. So this will have the correct initial stresses to balance the body forces that we're applying. And in that case, we should get zero displacements. So we'll test that out. Then the final one is where we again um, use gravitational body forces, but this is for a viscoelastic problem. We're again balancing with these same initial stresses, but in this case, when you balance uh, for the elastic solution, you still have de deviatoric stresses uh, left over. So once you allow viscous flow, it will flow to relieve those deviatoric stresses. So you will end up with large deformations as you progress in time. So this is the hard part with these problems, uh, getting things balanced. Uh, so we don't present a solution for that right here, but we show some of the problems. So the first one is, let me find. So our first one is step 08A. So that's the one where we uh, use analytical uh, solution to, to compute our initial stresses. Um, oh, right, I'll, I'll actually. Okay, so purely elastic uh, problem. What we first do of all is turn on the gravity field, which is not on by default. So we, um, that's done just here. Um, we're gonna have a uh, simulation time of zero years. It's, it's elastic uh, problem. Uh, we're going to, this is our, uh, we'll look at this spatial database, but it's uh, just computed at the, uh, we compute what the initial stresses should be at the top and at the bottom of the mesh, assuming a particular density. And then we, uh, so we just have the two points and then we do linear interpolation to apply those initial stresses. <coughs> we do that for each of our materials. You have to do it material by uh, material because you need initial stresses. So we do that for all of them. And then we just have our output nothing special there. So looking uh, 
okay? So here's our analytically uh, computed stresses. Um, so normal components, shear components, they're all in gigapascals. So two locations at z equals zero and z equals minus 400. There's our coordinate system information. We're doing geoprojection in this case. And then, so we only have two points. The top, there's no stress, zero stress. And then um, at uh, 400, you'll notice we're balancing with an isotropic stress state. This still balances with the elastic solution, even though uh, that will not be, because of Poisson's ratio, when you turn gravity on, you have a confined region, you'll have a Poisson's ratio effect where the horizontal stresses will be a fraction of the uh, vertical stresses, but the forces are still in equilibrium because there's zero horizontal deformation. So, okay, so here's how to run our thing. Okay, um, we can um, use one of those viz scripts if we want. Uh, uh, shoot up. Uh, okay, I have to look and see what. Ah, uh, that's what it is. Um, I have to refer to the manual to remember. Let's see. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, I didn't say, I think what I want to do is just, let's see if that works. Oh, geez. Okay. So obviously that's way too much. The default exaggeration. So what's the argument? Okay. What's the default is? I think you use 500. 500. Okay, so that's more like what we expected. So uh, what we have is um, what I said, the, the crust is lighter, so it went up on this side. The slab is uh, uh, denser, so it went down on this side. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what we predicted would happen, which is good. Yeah. Nope, not yet. This is still uh, infinitesimal uh, strain. Uh, it turns out that for elastic problems, uh, uh, it doesn't really, uh, it shouldn't, I don't believe it should matter that much. So you can use it your way to do Yeah, I'll, well, this is uh, a, a good user exercise. Try the finite strain formulation for this and see see if it makes much difference. Uh, right. 
here because that's what we're going to do next. Um, um, so the next one is, um, let me find. Okay. Okay, this is again using uh, this. So this is what we're going to do now is infinitesimal strain, but in this case, we correctly balance the initial stresses so that we, and we're gonna do that using a Python script as we generally do. So what we do, we've computed this uh, there's solution for step 08A. And when you do that, you've computed your stresses. We can actually Look at those. Okay. Okay, so um, what I'll do we'll just group all those so we can do everything to all of them all at once. And so there's our computed horizontal stress. If you look at the range here, and then computed vertical stress. So let's see, I've forgotten already what my, let's see, okay, stress, let's see, okay, those turned out, oh, that's because I balanced them. Um, okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to take these stresses and we're going to use the Python script in Spatial DB, or no, we'll just. Okay, so all this does is loops over all of the materials for a simulation. You read the, the state variables HDF5 uh, file, you get the stress, we get the cell centers because that's for the tetrahedral elements, that's uh, the, the Gauss point. And then um, we're gonna, again, make use of the Python interface to spatial data and write a spatial uh, database. In this case, there, we're gonna have a point for every cell in the, in the mesh. So when we do that, then we can do nearest neighbor interpolation to get the exact stress at each um, gauss point in the mesh. So that's, that's what we're doing there. So we'll go ahead and okay, so that made all of these spatial databases. Um, we'll just look at one. Okay. So here we've uh, got all our stress components. We did it in Pascal's. Uh, this is just for the, uh, the points that are within the crust uh, material. So we'll have a separate one for each material. Then X, Y, Z coordinates, and then all of your different stress components. <coughs> Okay, so this will be very similar to step 08A. So again, we have that, we turn on gravity. Again, only uh, zero years. Uh, in this case, we're um, 
now we're using a different spatial database for each material. So here's the one we've computed for the slab. There's the one we computed for the wedge, mantle, and then the crust. And then we just have our output there. Okay, so. So we'll just run that. Well, I'm, I'm just going to quit that pair of view. Uh, I'll tell you why it's taking so long right now, because it's having to find which um, point in the spatial, uh, spatial data base can corresponds to each cell in the mesh. So that's what's taking a long time. It's having to find it and, uh, and get the value it. So this, uh, this is something that if you're doing problems with complicated variations in your material properties, this initial part will take quite a long time sometimes, um, but uh, once you've done it, then you don't have to do it again. So you can continue on with your solution. It will finish. In the meantime, any quick questions? What the, well, there's only one time step for this one. Oh, yeah, yeah, if you have multiple time steps, it's only the first one that, yeah, because of this step right now. No, we're not time stepping yet. This is initialization, yeah. So, yeah. So, you have a lot of deformation uh, because you're not incorporated in the system. Like that. There's a lot of deformation in after that because the deformation relative to the next thing is very small, then it'll get done. Yeah. So, anyway, this. Um, okay, so. We'll, we'll get carried away. We'll try 10,000 to, just to see if it shows anything. Yeah, even a well, factor of 10,000, you're not seeing any. So that means we properly balanced our stresses. There's zero deformation. So we've counterbalanced gravity with the initial stresses that we applied. So uh, this uh, can be useful just for, um, well, I'm trying to think if there's any elastic problem where you really need gravity. Yeah, if you have a rigor, you need it. No, no, an elastic problem. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, stresses on the faults and 3D variations. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, so you can, yeah, that would be a case. So the final one that we're going to do is so this is the exact same problem but in this case we're using a uh, finite strain and we're doing a viscoelastic problem so you can see that we're getting a lot of deformation more actually than we had for the elastic situation and the reason is because we uh, the viscous flow, and we'll, we'll just look at how it progresses with time, uh, but viscous flow will continue to occur as long as you have deviatoric stresses. And the problem is part of these materials are elastic, so you will always have deviatoric stresses.
So uh, for this one, uh, we've already generated the uh, spatial database that we need. So the only new parts are Okay, down here. So here we're uh, turning on the finite strain formulation. And once you do that, uh, the problem automatically becomes nonlinear. So, because you, you have geometric nonlinearity. So, uh, Pilot recognizes that automatically without you having to uh, change the uh, solution type. And again, we turn on the gravity field. Now we're going to run this thing for 100 years, and we're going to take time steps of 10 years. OK, and then we have the same initial stresses that we had before. OK. Oops, let me just look what we need to do. Okay, again, we're gonna have the long initialization time. Uh, I probably should have pre-run, I wonder if I did pre-run this, let me see. Uh, maybe it's not too late to, let me see. No, too late. Um, <laughs> it'll, uh, it'll, uh, started overriding some of the files from before. I'll just have that ready. Um, um, I'm trying to think uh, what else I could tell you about this. You've, I've already described what is going to happen. It's just that we have Deviatoric stresses that viscous flow is going to happen. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Any questions now? No? Okay, finally starting to run here. Even though it is a nonlinear problem, you'll notice that it's converging pretty quickly. Yes. Wait, say that again? That Yes, yes. Uh, so if your problem just has layers, uh, so if it doesn't have um, uh, horizontal variations, then yes, you could compute all of your initial stresses analytically using multiple layers. Is that, is that what you're wanting to know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that should work fine. And in that case, you won't have any problem balancing things, even for a viscoelastic problem. It's the, it's the lateral variations that introduce the 
uh, deviatoric stresses. Okay, just about there. <laughs> Okay, so we're just going to look first um, at the um, at the deformation. And let's see. And so this is the elastic solution. And you can see that it's just as it was for step OB. We balance the stresses so there's no vertical deformation. But then what we're going to see. Uh, as we start going forward, whoa, yep, um, we'll rescale and I may damp down the warping factor. Okay, so as, as we step forward, we're getting more and more um, vertical displacement. So we start off with zero, And then we end up with this huge amount of vertical displacement. So what we have, let's look at the, oops, that's not the one I want. <coughs> Okay, so we'll turn that off. So again, we'll, we'll group these so we can look at everything all at once. So what we can, that thing annoys me. Um, let's just see what happens with the, well, you can see a slight change in the stress, but what we have, let's look at, ah, okay. I meant to look at the viscous strain, but I forgot to output it. So, um, look at the shear stress. I can look at the shear stress. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, scale that. So there's the initial shear stress. So you do have some just because of the density variations. Eh. It's not hugely interesting. Well, you're looking at hard. Did you slice it? Ah, okay. I can, yeah, that's what I need to do is take a slice. Okay, so let's try that again. I don't think it's going to change this. Yes, here we go. Oh, stress XX. Okay, so this I think will change. Well, I think you want XZ. 
Yeah, that's uh, let's see. There you go. Okay, that's more interesting. Yeah, that's more interesting. Yeah, that's that's more interesting. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so that is doing what we would like, which is reducing the shear stress over time. Well, the shear stress here is a proxy for the second deviatoric uh, stress invariant. So, okay, so it is reducing, um, but it's only doing it. Um, it can't really do it in the materials that are uh, purely elastic, which would be the crust in the slab, right? Or let's see, wait, which are, no, what, which are the? The crust and the wedge. Crusts in the wedge are purely elastic. Yeah. So you can see that that big red area in the crust has shear stress in it, and it is going to keep impinging shear stress on the mat on the slab below it um, yeah. due to continuity, continuity of uh, strain across that interface. And so it's always, unless you can reduce that shear strain across the interface to zero, which you can't do because the elastic Because it's elastic, it's yeah. It's gonna keep impinging shear stress, deviated work stress uh, in the slab. And there's also, you know, the very long relaxation time at shallow depths. Um, so yeah, it's so it would take, yeah, it would take quite a while for this to completely relax. Yeah, um, yeah so anyway, that's, essentially demonstrates the problems with balancing stresses for viscoelastic uh, problems. And that's, yeah, I think that's it for this one. Any questions or do people want to play with this? So I think we already came up with some ideas of things to do. Okay, is there anything else that people want that from earlier today that anybody wants to see more of or less of? <laughs> ah, okay, because you use finite strain because uh, with infinitesimal strain, the body forces are computed using the same configuration uh, no matter how much deformation has occurred. So that if you start lifting things up, the body forces remain the same, even though the, the body is no longer the same. But for finite strain, that is taken into account. You've recomputed the body forces for the new deformed body. So that's, uh, and the end result of that is um, when you do that, it tends to damp down the amount of vertical displacement that you get. So the infinitesimal strain will probably overpredict the amount of vertical displacement. 